Good afternoon. This is Jim Bell with the Diversity Consortium and welcome to the XBE Thrive sourcing the working capital needs. Uh, we appreciate you spending the afternoon with us. Uh, the this session today is part of our XBE Thrive webinar series. It's a monthly event that uh, handles different topics every month. Uh, there are a couple of things that uh, Randall Dobbins, who is the president of Diversity Consortium, is going to talk to us about housekeeping and then we're going to get right into it. A little bit about uh, the housekeeping here. You'll see we're using Microsoft Teams and uh, you'll see a dashboard at the top of your screen right now. The webinar uh, on your end is audio only and there are no dial in numbers. Uh, if you have any questions at any time, feel free to um, put them in the chat and we'll respond to your questions uh, at, when we get to the Q&A portion. And uh, you may see a few survey questions come in throughout the throughout the the webinar. Uh, we'd ask that you participate so we have a good sense of issues that are near and dear to your business right now. And by all means, uh, our production team stands ready to support you if you have if you need any any help or whatnot. Uh, just raise your hand, and uh, they will respond to you quickly. So, as Jim mentioned, uh, my name my name is Randall Dobbins. This is the Diversity Consortium. Our mission is to make a true measurable difference in the supplier diversity landscape. Uh, specifically, if you are an XBE, we are here to make sure that you have the scalability to support supply large contracts or to support large contracts and you have the capacity. And in this case, we are talking prim primarily today about financial support, but we have other areas in which case we can make sure that you can handle the business up today and tomorrow. And if you are a corporation uh, similar to uh, Similar to what we do with an XBE, we uh, drive profits and uh, material benefit to your business as well. So we are glad to have both of you here. So Randall, one thing just to, to clarify the term XBE, uh, we at the Diversity Consortium look at um, all disadvantaged business enterprises, whether it be ethnicity, gender, physical ability, uh, military service, uh, sexual preference, and we categorize them all inclusively as XBEs. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that, Jim. And for uh, the entire group, the big issue that we see for all sm small business owners or XBEs is uh, in, in a survey where we where that was conducted to look through what are the local challenges or the, the predominant challenges? We see that the largest issue is the cost of providing health care coverage to employees, followed by attracting new customers, uh, the rising cost of business, given our supply chain disruption going on right now, that's an even bigger issue. Retaining employees with the great resignation is an issue. We still are trying to get certainty around taxation. Obviously, the competitive landscape with your larger competitors is coming in at uh, number seven there. Government regulations, I think we all just kind of managed through that. But the biggest one, the eighth ranked challenge, and uh, for those of us that have made it through the pandemic, uh, we know that lack of access to credit or capital is a huge concern. That one may actually, if, if this survey was conducted today, might actually jump up four or five notches. Yeah, Randy, you're absolutely right. And and uh, with the interest rates rising, and it, it seems to be more competitive to get to that to get to that money, um, our clients are seeing and and talking more and more about it. So it's it's really becoming quite an issue. Absolutely. So what we wanted to talk about today, uh, you can see on our agenda here, is why do businesses or specifically small business struggle to obtain traditional financing? What is the uh, current data surrounding XBE owned businesses and access to finance? Uh, we also want to introduce some options to supporting you in managing working capital. And uh, we are fortunate today to actually have a, a client on this call with us, and he's going to share with us his experience in raising funds. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, uh, Randall, we are just exiting a market research project where we are identifying and putting the demographics are all, all around all 24 million XBEs or disadvantaged businesses in the US. 
So it's going to be exciting to kind of hear some some of the specifics around that and certainly the story from some of the people that are trying to work for for uh, capital access through our systems. Oh yeah, absolutely. So so Jim, you want to walk us through the main types of capital here? Yeah, absolutely. So so as we have launched our our financial services, um, we found that there are many instruments out there and, and some are right for people in certain circumstances, but there's not really one silver bullet. Every organization's got its unique needs. Um, some people just need cash flow, the working capital to support the business. Some people are, are interested in borrowing money that they have to pay back, of course. Um, some people are, are interested in trading equity, investors for money. Um, and then and some people can just work with their value chain, both up and down their value chain to improve their terms. And that improving of terms actually provides the cash flow that they need. So as we as we were developing our solution set around that, we recognized that we needed to be dealing in each one of these areas. Thank, thank you for that, Jim. Yeah, er, just uh, for everyone's benefit, one of the big things that we find in doing this work is um, debt financing actually becomes a, a much bigger issue. Most of us are familiar with that, especially if we've had a car car loan or a home loan uh, or some of you on this call that may have come from the finance industry. You, you, you're quite familiar with debt financing, but as the overarching structure, we typically look at about three general categories. Uh, term loans, in this case, you're borrowing a set amount of money from a lender. You receive a lump sum up front and you pay the money back with interest and for the term of the loan. Uh, a line of credit, uh, and in this case, we're talking about something that's termed, that's deemed a, a, a revolving loan, in which case you have access to a set credit line that you can pull from and use as needed. And more often than not, unlike a term loan mentioned above, you only pay interest on the funds you use. So that gives you quite a bit of flexibility for, for that one, uh, especially if you are working in construction or trying to get a project going. You don't always have the same size project, but in order to fund payroll or do other kinds of things, you just need to draw down on your line of credit to get you through a period until your, your customers come back, but you're not obligated for the entire uh, facility, only what you drew down and then the interest on it until you are in position to pay the, the actual um, uh, uh, principal back. And then cash flow loans. And in this case, with cash flow loans, you receive an advance of funds based on the revenues you're earning. Uh, and then instead of paying back money over time with interest, you receive the re remaining percentage of your revenue minus the lender fees as your cash flow comes in. So uh, in this case, uh, invoice financing and merchant cash advances both could be considered what we would deem cash flow loans. It, Jim, anything else you'd like to add to that? No, I, I think there is a place for each one of these uh, and sometimes even some more options. So it's great to start with that kind of foundation of what the primary areas are. So thank you. Sure. I, I think one other thing that I, I do want to tee up before Jim walks us through this particular issue is there, there have been a number of challenges with XBEs getting financing, but one of the bigger ones is we really didn't have a good sense of how do we establish a banking relationship before we actually need it. That has been a huge challenge. Just, you know, my, my personal story on this is um, I was fortunate enough in my public high school that one of the, my friends actually, his father was the vice president of a bank in Ohio. And so I, I had no fear of bankers. And it interestingly enough, when I went to school, uh, he asked me if I was going to come to the bank for a student loan. He understood my family situations, but because he knew me, uh, my, my loan process was, I think I got the money done, the money before I filled out the application. And it was because he knew me. My uh, other story was uh, uh, when I was in my 20s in Texas, you, your banks were opening quite a bit. I'd walked into a new one that had started up. I got a chance to meet the bank president. And interestingly enough, anytime I needed a financial product, I was able to walk in the door, have a conversation with him and just say, it, uh, you know, here's what I'm trying to do. And he would he could tell me right then and there what the bank could do. He made decisions based on knowing me 
right then and there, even in my early 20s. So what I'm going to tell everybody here is if you don't know your bank or your banker, it's never too late to start. And um, you can develop these relationships with some of the bigger banks, uh, but the smaller banks for XBEs tend to have a lot more flexibility and capability to support you. But Jim, well, you want to walk us through this one? Or yeah, if you absolutely. Have any, any, Randall. any re reaction to what I just said? Feel free to chime in. Yeah, I just want to. I just want to jump in a little bit of my story, and that, and I'm probably like most. When you need money, you can't get it. When you have money, they're willing to loan it to you all day. And in having a relationship and having your instruments and financial financial vehicles in place before you need them or be thoughtful about the way you plan for them is is certainly a key to success here. And what we wanted to spend just a few minutes on here is is why do businesses and particularly disadvantaged businesses struggle? And there has been a fair amount of of research and and public. Uh, inspection on this because there appears to be, you know, some things that don't look fair and equitable, right? And 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 what we see typically in in smaller businesses, uh, and the ownership of those smaller businesses is that they just have lower net worth, right? They don't have the assets, fixed assets or real estate assets to be able to put up collateral. They don't have the cash flows that would support the amount of money that they need when they get themselves in trouble. So that tends to be a, 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 a big challenge. It's because people wait a little late to figure out that what they need, how much they need, and, and when they need it. Uh, a second and, big- and, and Jeff, if, if I can tag onto that for a second, because this is very true in our XBE community, the, the, the lack of assets, if you are running a professional services business, um, which a good number of us get in. We start with professional services because that seems to be the smartest and easiest one to get into because the the capital requirement to start a professional services business is not as huge. Um, that that lack of assets piece really hits us hard in in that area. Yeah, so true, so true. And 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 to double that, Randall, with uh, XBEs. Are, are often in economically challenged areas, right? So, so the assets that they may have, um, a, a home or or some other piece of real estate, isn't going to have the value it might have in other more desirable places. So, so that makes a big difference. A a same size home in two communities could be vastly different. Um, a, a third piece here is is that people haven't necessarily managed their credit. Uh, over time well. Uh, many entrepreneurs, and including myself at times, don't necessarily have the best credit because we're forced to, to, to take risks. And sometimes those risks pay off and sometimes they don't. We, uh, we have that and <clears throat> a, a number of us, when we started our companies, nobody really helped us to differentiate between business credit versus personal credit. So we've gotten ourselves in a situation where our per personal credit is is doing everything. And uh, right now, the the industry, the, the credit industry has just come so far along that, um, you, you know, you can be intentional about building business credit and you can begin to get to a point where you eliminate the need to personally have to stand behind um, um, e everything that you're trying to do. Well, and we see that nine out of 10 of our prospective clients in that that they have used their personal net worth to fund their business and and you get into that cycle and then you're kind of stuck there. So yep. uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that when we see some some of the stats uh, out of the research that comes. So that's a great point, Randall. Um, I, I think we all recognize that um, having a relationship that you talked about is important. Um, not having that relationship, quick judgments are made and not always are they made for the right reasons. So so we do see discrimination um, and, and I think the stats are going to show us a little bit of that. Uh, but what are the things that I found most intriguing, Randall, in this in this growth of learning this this area is that if you ask typically disadvantaged businesses, how they fund, they fund it in ways outside the banking systems because they have no confidence that the banks are going to do anything for them. So they don't even waste their time. They they figure out how to fund it themselves. 
they do friends and family, they do uh, equity investment, but they don't even go to the bank because they just have no confidence that it'll actually happen. Historically, that's that's been their their reality. And to your point, <clears throat> Jim, and when we teed this up, uh, when we start talking about the the bigger contracts and building out capacity, um, it, it's it's hard to bootstrap that. It's hard to do it, you, you know, out of out of your own pocket. And so you you get to a point where, you know, not having access to capital actually limits the 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 ability for you to grow your business. Well, and, and that's absolutely true. Inside the Diversity Consortium, we work to help XBEs exponentially grow their business. And and more often than not, people are limited by their ability to, to, to provide the working capital. They could double their business, but they don't have the cash on hand to be able to do it. So mm -hmm. they, they slow burn it. And then, you know, you have to do what you have to do to survive. Yep. So what I wanted to share, the Federal Reserve Board has done an enormous amount of study and, and really making a genuine attempt to try to bring equity and, and parity to the markets. But this is one particular uh, data set that I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, it, it In an explanation of what this slide is, you kind of look to the, to the left, that is um, a good credit people, uh, low credit risk folks. To the, to the right are people that their credit is not as effective or not as good, all right, and uh, high credit risk sort of people. You look at the differences between um, white and black, top line, bottom line there. Double the amount of white applicants get their money than that of blacks. Um, almost double get none of the money that they ask for. Uh, of course, now they get they get some portion of what they ask for, and that kind of moves around. But if you just look at that in the low credit line, uh, the low credit risk line, or the good credit people, th that's that's a little disheartening. Um, and 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 I know that banks and and the government sector and organizations like yours, Randall, the the advocates for s diverse suppliers are, are trying to work on that. But there's a lot of room. Um, and it's even interesting as you look at people with with poor credit, the people with poor credit that are white are almost equal to the to the non-white people with good credit. You know, so it, it really is a disparity that we need to see if we can help close. And I think that's a big reason why we we have financial services inside the diversity consortium. It's it's to help understand what those vehicle options are. What are the right institutions that are looking for certain things that match up with with organizations, uh, XBEs and the cash flows that they might need? So so at this point, has, has Vincent joined us yet? We, we yeah, have Vince. Vince is on with us. Um, <clears throat> Vince, if you want to go on camera for a hot second and tell everyone hello. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and Vince, um, Vince has is working through the process of of getting access to working capital through the diversity consortium. He came in, uh, I believe, through um, a a press release and some information on our website. But but Vince, I was just hoping if you'd just take a moment, kind of tell people your background, the business that you're in, why you were looking for capital, how you came to the diversity consortium, and let's just let's just kind of get to know you a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, well, again, thank you guys uh, for having me. Want we'll to make sure you can hear me? Okay. We can yeah, hear you. Okay. Awesome. Just fine. Great. Um, yeah. So I actually spent most, if not all, my career in the financial services space um, uh, on the regulatory compliance side. So hearing about the Fed, FDIC. Um, so I basically examined banks, um, all things um, retail banking, uh, consumer lend, uh, consumer uh, protection. Uh, you know, started out in, at the FDIC and, um, uh, you know, examined, examined financial institutions and um, decided I wanted to branch out on my own, you know, long story short, um, started my own professional services uh, company where I basically did a lot or am doing uh, what I did a lot of as a uh, former regulator. Um, and so it's, it's rewarding because I get to do the thing that I love to do, uh, that is to help companies now or, or banks um, uh, shore up any any weaknesses or identify if there are any gaps I can help you know kind of walk them through 
to get kind of back on square one. Um, and so I, you know, joined uh, NMSDC actually about, I guess I'm going up now two years ago and, and got um, connected with the uh, Emerging Young Entrepreneurs Program. And I think that's kind of where I had heard about the, got an email about the Diversity Consortium and, you know, I was looking to kind of build um, capital because as you guys were talking, like you said, it's, you know, I, I want it to not uh, uh, give up all of my personal, you know, savings and that sort of thing. I wanted to kind of build up my, you know, business credit and, and um, sort of have a, a, a reserve of cash, you know, in between business um, uh, contracts kind of thing. So that's kind of how I got connected with you all. And, um, and I guess the rest is history. <laughs> well, thank you, Vincent. I, I appreciate that. Um, have you had the opportunity to look at a variety of sources or is this really kind of the beginning of your of your journey yeah i, I gotta say you this is this is sort of the beginning i haven't i i didn't really take the approach to to go with like a bigger bank so that's what thinking again because i'm a startup so to your y'all's point you know larger banks or larger institutions view startups as higher risk you know they want to be able to uh ensure that the people that they you know do business with they that they are able to um uh that they're viable but again now it's kind of the double-edged sword because now there's um uh sort of mandates that they work with these smaller and you know companies and particularly diversity i mean sort of diverse um small businesses and, and that sort of thing so um you know like I said, I just decided to, to to start here and kind of work my way up as as my business sort of naturally progresses and um, you know stand up and, and and bring on more resources. Well, Vince, I I appreciate you sharing your 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 business and your opportunity and kind of your journey with us. Absolutely. Um, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about those financial services and the vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're going to open up for questions. So if if you don't mind sticking around with us for a little while, yeah, sure. um, that would love to have you participate. We'll have you pop off your your camera for a moment, sure. and then we'll kind of run through this, and then uh, we'll we'll jump into questions as soon as we're done. So Randall, if it's okay, let me uh, walk through kind of financial services within the diversity consortium. So so that, basically, that would be great. Thanks, Jim. Awesome. So uh, in, in the Diversity Consortium, we've been working for about a year um, and particularly following all of the financial institutions that have made commitments and claims into this diverse business community. Um, watching the, the funds that they were making available, understanding the programs that they had in place, um, doing a fair bit of research of what kind of companies and what kind of vehicles there were. We actually had started off initially with um, a lot of 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 the uh, the cash flow type financing, a lot of uh, EO financing and, and accounts receivable financing, even down to some equipment leases. And as we got more and more people coming our direction, we recognized that we needed a much broader uh, vehicle set to be able to address the needs. So through work with our, our partners, uh, the lenders, some state organizations and some federal small business groups, we, we came up with a composite or a, a set of vehicles that we thought would meet the line share of, of what's going on in the marketplace. And let me kind of take you to the first and the last micro loans and high credit risk fund. So let's talk about microloans first, and this is really small amounts of money, um, less than $10,000, less than 30 to 60 days in duration, and it's really just a bridge place. It doesn't take much in the way of, of application or, or credit worthiness. It's really just an understanding, and it's intended to be a hand up for some folks. Um, and we do those ourselves out of the funds of the Diversity Consortium. The other end of that book in um, high credit risk fund is allowing funds to be loaned at market rates, three and a half percent kind of money to people that don't generally qualify for that. And as long as they stay within the terms of the, the loan, they make their payments on time, they can get you know, good credit risk funding availability. 
If they don't, then it goes back to to something that is not nearly as attractive. But it's really again trying to give people an opportunity to 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 go build their credit and get what they need. Both that first and last item are DC funded. So so we don't have partners to do that. We have some corporations that have created some some funding support in there, but we administer all of those. Everything in between conventional financing down to merger and acquisition financing are, are partners, are funders. And in each one kind of has their own reason, conventional financing and, and certainly Randall, you talk to us about that. Typically termed loans, um, there are some equity loans that are there, but you go to your bank and you make those. The next one are, are government guaranteed loans and SBA we're mostly familiar with, but there are a variety of, of government guaranteed loans that just make lenders more satisfied that they're going to get paid. The process to get those approved is a little arduous, but you know the people are more, are more willing to make those loans because they're first are they're guaranteed by the government. Uh, debt equity is about selling your a piece a piece of your organization ownership in stock or in membership uh, and for money and and uh, there are people that do that there will also people that will um, loan money with stock as a um, as a backer so so basically you're providing ownership of the company as collateral we, we've seen some great exercises in recent years in crowdfunding so someone's got a good story and and you get it out in in uh, uh, a GoFundMe type environment, and there are some that are more dedicated towards the business climate, but people can see and participate, and and they can do it in small uh, increments. We we have a, a client right now that has raised about seventy thousand um, dollars. Their their need is is much greater than this, but this provided a group of owners ultimately that uh, that that came in and was able to fund some of the operational needs of the business and really change the complexion of, of what the company was doing and why they were doing it. Mezzanine funds are really the the bridge between what's going on and what we want to have going on. So I need more sales, but I need the the inventory to, to be able to sell those sales. So I get a mezzanine fund to fund that short term need then in positions for me to be able to go out and refinance that whole stack. So the mezzanine funds often provide some flexibility between places. The, the idea of strategic alliance funding, and this is that value chain, being able to go to your supplier and say, I can grow my business by double and double the amount that I buy for you, but can you extend me better terms uh, for a short period of time? May I go from 30 days net to 90 days net while I kind of consume this business growth? Having your suppliers and or the people that are paying you um, modify their typical um, days outstanding or their their repayment structure is is uh, can often provide the cash flow that you need to do well. Um, quick pay solutions. These are, are often almost like a credit card advance. Um, and if you pay them back quickly, they can be very cost effective. Um, if the, you don't pay them back like these 30 day or 90 days, same as cash, they, they revert to a less than attractive uh, place. But there are some options and, and you have to be super careful with those. PO financing and invoice financing. I've got a purchase order for my customer. I haven't been paid yet people will pay you a, a, a high percentage of that value based on the credit worthiness of your customer. So, so those are, are often very interesting. And we see companies that are in approved invoices and just waiting for the cash to come. We see lots of, lots of people will finance their business uh, almost entirely on that. And you could see large chunks of, of taking down uh, accounts receivable, it coming in and paying it back, and, and that happens on a month by month basis. Um, the idea of factoring is is taking those invoices and someone will pay you some percentage of that in advance of it coming in. Um, equipment inventory uh, or, or inventory financing is things that are in your warehouse or on your shelves. Um, and they'll floor plan it for you. Well, we would know this most from 
car dealers. Most of the cars that are on a car dealer's lot are not actually owned by the car dealer, but by a, a credit instrument or a, a financing company that they pay that and the, the, the dealer would pay interest until that car sells. So that kind of happens. Uh, certainly not having to pay for equipment, being able to finance it or or lease it, keeps your, uh, keeps your cash flow in a more positive place. We have found particularly post COVID that um, grants and foundational um, access to capital is, is increasing. Many organizations are trying to figure out how they improve the communities in which they work, live and play. So there are some programs out there that depending on the, the organization, its mission and its customer set can be ideal for these. And then there's this non-conventional, right? It's it's not a bank necessarily. It might be a, a private individual or a, a family office that are willing to, to do transaction because it makes sense for them. I've seen really good ones of these, and I've seen some ones that are probably not structured for, for most of our client base, but, but yet they're out there. So being able to kind of look through those and see what makes sense for a particular circumstance makes a lot of sense. And then the structure of, of merger and acquisition, a super effective way to grow the revenues of a business, but boy, to be able to take on that debt and be able to service that debt can be super challenging. So a lot of people will walk away from those opportunities. So trying to bring an organization in that understands those needs is of, of, of great flexibility for people that want them. So, so that is what we call financial services. We have a, a pretty standardized process that um, if you're interested, you, you fill out a, a fairly quick intake form. With that, they'll be scheduled an opportunity to chat with one of the representatives. Um, from there, there's actually a, a formal intake and then an abstract is created about what's the right mechanisms and vehicles to accomplish the goal and what's the probability of success there. So that's the way financial services work. Um, I think, Randall, if there's nothing else, if there's anything you want to add, I certainly want to give you that opportunity, but I'd love to open up to the phones and let's just take some questions. Yeah, let's take some questions. That's a, a good walk down of everything. And, um, you know, I think if you're an XBE, you may not have even known all of these options were available. So it's 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 definitely worth exploring. Great, so if we're ready for questions, uh, we've got a handful that have rolled in, so I'll just start from the top. Um, the first one is from Brian T. Uh, he says, I've already got SBA funding and need more. Can I apply for additional funding? So so the answer to that is, is, is yes, if circumstances uh, allow it, we will often work with the initial lender um, look at the circumstances and see if there is a way to extend. Um, so, so the answer to that question is yes, there absolutely can be. There also might be ways to move to a different program, a yeah, guaranteed loan uh, of a different place or conventional or one of these other instruments, all of which are options and really just need to understand the circumstances and the values that we're trying to trying to accomplish. All right. Uh, next question is from Emma P. Uh, I've been denied funding before. Are there, are there any resources or guide or for guidance to build my credit and chances of getting approved? Yeah, so that's a great question, and 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 that happens unfortunately to a lot of us. Um, so so there are some things, and we we work with a variety of organizations. I have to do a plug here for the small business development centers, the SBA funded uh, organization and there's I think 62 branches or or agencies across the the United States and, and the provinces and and they help with that trying to understand what that credit situation is and what the things need to be done to improve the business plan the the forecasting structure and the credit performance that will help people get themselves squared away. So we tend to try to sit down and understand really what the story is, what the real need is, being able to articulate it clearly, uh, be able to describe use of funds, and, and that along with that credit repair activity often can be more successful. Great, um, next question is from Tamara L. 
I think my business could use some guidance on how to build a more attractive profile and application, but this presentation has me wondering if I am in better shape than I thought. Is there any risk in starting the conversation? Um, Randall, do you want to take this one or do you want me to? I'll 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 start. I'm just going to recap what I said previously, but I'd, I'd, I'd love for you to add your thoughts to it as well, Jim. Um, once again, we mentioned you want to begin to start developing a relationship sooner than later, uh, because I think the other thing that you want to make sure that you zero in on, and this is probably not as obvious to a lot of XBEs, but you actually want to interview the people that are that are uh, providing the money. I mean, you you may decide that you don't want to take money from them. So in the process of putting everything together and thinking about how you would move forward, you also want to consider, you, you know, to the extent that you can do some research and ask yourself who is a good provider for me. You, you know, what 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 actually makes sense for my business, as Jim mentioned a, a moment ago. Then you want to think through that now you know specifically with what the the, the services that the dc is offering then once again you, you know you by all means want to get started sooner on this and have things in place before you you really and truly need them or it becomes mission critical J jim you want to add any more to that yeah randall and i think you make a great spot and we we all probably can relate to when we get married or when we interview for a job most often we feel in the in the uh, disadvantaged spot right interviewing for a job they're looking at me do they want me but the the worst thing in the world is is if they take you and you don't want to be there they're not the right people for you so you make a great spot does the business align does the business uh, feel right to be in partnership with because when you when you do financing with an organization and in a lot of senses you are partners but to go back to the original question th there's no risk in understanding what the perspective is of your of your business and of your financial plan and your your needs for for working capital and your use it's always great to get a view of that there's no negative score by going and doing it it can only help Awesome. Um, so uh, next question is Jessica M. Uh, is how do I get more information? Um, well, first would love to invite you to the Diversity Consortium website. Uh, we'll show it a little bit later, but uh, the diversityconsortium.com. Um, under XBE services, there's financial services, and there's a, a ton of information there. There's a sign up page. I believe that there is uh, may I, or talk to a representative. So there's lots of ways to get there. And at the end of this presentation, we'll be showing uh, a contact information, um, but would love to get in touch. And there'll be emails for Randall and some of his team that will also be available for you to just call in and they're they're going to be glad to help you. Great. And, and Adam, before you, you move forward, Vincent, did you want to weigh in on any of the questions that have been asked uh, so far? Uh, no, I mean, really, you guys have kind of covered everything I was I would say, um, you know, if if I had to offer any kind of advice as to kind of if, if if nothing else is to remain positive and not, you know, a no is not necessarily uh, uh, you know, the end all be all. The no could just mean not right now. And and I think, you know, once you make up your mind and, and decide that this is, you know, your business that you you believe in it, then you just have to basically convince others to believe in it. And so, um, you know, that's sort of my been my approach. And and you know, looking at the glass half full, um, it's been very very helpful. So, yeah, just want to share that. Thanks for that, Vince. And Adam, sorry to interrupt you you keep going <laughs> oh, that's all right uh, i think probably for the sake of time and be respectful of people's time we've got about five more minutes left so maybe one more question um and those that we missed we'll follow up with um we'll make sure everybody gets answers to their question after um the event ends but uh so don't worry uh but the i'll do one more question it's from sarah h she says i have ideas for expanding my business but i'm hesitant to utilize reserved funds I'm worried about the risk and could use some advising on what financial vehicle would make sense and how much funding makes sense to take. How do I connect with an advisor? 
Well, again, I, I would uh, direct towards Randall and, and the, the financial services team, but I, I would tell if uh, Sarah, there is uh, micros that are done as, as part of the diversity consortium, the education programs inside the XBE thrives. There are, are very much deep dives into certain subjects and there are many in the financial services world. So if you go onto the website and you go into the uh, uh, to the past conversations, there's a lot to be learned there. Um, they also, the Diversity Consortium has collected gads of information from every entity, entity imaginable on the topics and services that they provide, trying to be a resource uh, to folks, not reinvent the wheel, right? try to try to be a library of sorts. So, uh, you know, go into the to the website or make a call to a rep and let's see if we can't figure out what you need and what the easiest path to to getting you good information so you can make an educated decision. All right, so I, I think that uh, that that wraps it up. I appreciate all the questions from everybody in the audience. Adam, thank you for for going through and, and I wanted to reiterate uh, we will have written responses to every one of these questions. We'll distribute it to all the people that were on the call today. Um, if we didn't get to your question, you'll of course it will be answered along with all the others that we did handle on the call, so we we won't miss anyone. Um, thank you guys for participating in that way. Uh, this has been the XBE Thrive webinar series. Uh, we've had uh, the the grade uh, topics of conversation. Uh, in the past uh, for this year and each month, I believe we've done eight or 10 micros additionally each month. Uh, all of those are recorded for posterity, so you can go in and just select to be able to review them. Uh, the next Thrive is, is the 28th of July, and it will be about um, health benefits inside an XBE's organization. How do we provide competitive benefits to our staff when we don't have the leverage and scale of a large company with traditional insurance. So hopefully that is of interest to some and we would certainly love to have you. Uh, please get on and register. We have found on, on some of these topics that we we actually have more attendees than we can support. So uh, getting in and getting registered and getting a link will, will ensure your spot. Um, the, the micros that, uh, that we're gonna be doing over the next 90 days or so are around technology, marketing, uh, training and development, and these other topics. So, so those should be on the event calendar, so you can go in and register. They'll send you a link, and it'll bring you into either a live event like you're in now or into an open discussion room uh, where you can actually participate with the panel and, and ask questions and share files and such. But you can see all of that on the, on the, the website and be able to schedule. Um, we thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate the privilege of your time uh, at the Diversity Consortium. We're committed to, to helping change the landscape of, of supplier diversity and uh, please call us. Uh, phone number of our chief operating officer, his email, um, and then of course the, the office and the website. So, uh, so please contact us if we can give any help and have a wonderful 4th of July weekend.